Hey Braves, so um, this week's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm going over ecological roles with you, however I won't be going out to Lions Park to do a lot of my recording. My daughter's been sick since Friday, so I have not been um, able to get out to the ecosystem. However, at my own home here, I've put a lot of effort into growing plants uh, to bring in different pollinators and, and other wildlife into my own backyard. So I have a lot of examples of ecological roles um, basically from my own backyard to share with you this week so that you have some solid real clear um, examples of what a decomposer or a producer or a primary or secondary consumer are. So <clears throat> the plan really at this point is for you guys to go out into your ecosystems and identify several examples of all of these very important uh, diff types of organisms, different roles or parts of the uh, energy pyramid that they belong to. Producers are anything that photosynthesizes and creates their own food. Um, all of your producers are green because they have chlorophyll in them, which allows them to absorb sunlight and make sugar or glucose out of CO2 and water. Primary consumers are your herbivores. They consume the producers. Straightforward. This could be um, a caterpillar eating a leaf. This could be some sort of a bacteria that's munching on some uh, algae, some microscopic algae. This could be a cow munching on some grass, right? All of these things are primary consumers and they get most of their energy from plant material. All of these particular organisms have the proper enzymes to break down the cellulose fibers that we humans generally have a hard time breaking down and they're able to break up those dense chains of glucose into single chains of our single glucose molecules that they can then use to make energy through cellular respiration. Your secondary consumers are things that eat other creatures. So not just plants, but they eat other insects or animals of some sort. So if you have to chase it down, you're a secondary consumer. Examples of this could be a spider eating an ant or a fly. Um, it could be a dog that is eating a mouse that it caught, or a cat that is eating a mouse. It could be a velociraptor chasing down its prey. If you eat another animal or insect or something else that moves, you are a secondary consumer. Now that's a big chunk of, you know, different species of organisms and different food sources. Finally, you get to your top predators, and your top predators are the ones where nothing else can eat them. They're the very tip top of the food chain. These things can be like red tail hawks, and those tend to be your top predators in the area. It can also be mountain lions, which do come through Kansas occasionally. However, you're never going to see these things, and if you ever do, you're, it's basically you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than seeing a mountain lion here in Kansas. That doesn't mean they're not here, but there might be a handful for the entire state. Bobcats could also be considered a top predator in this area. Nothing will mess with a, bo uh, a bobcat. So basically it's whatever sits at the very top of your particular ecosystem that nothing else can take a whack at. Now, all of those things being said, those are the main trophic levels of the energy pyramid. But there's one other thing that we have to consider, and that's decomposers. And decomposers are as important as your producers. And the reason decomposers are important is slightly different than that of producers. Producers are important because they're getting the energy uh, from the sun to infuse into the ecosystem. And without them, eventually we would run out of energy uh, to survive on. So plants, producers, are incredibly important to life. Again, there's no way for us to get energy here on Earth uh, without them. However, decomposers, on the other hand, are important because they recycle the matter and energy that's locked up in body parts. So, for instance, going back to that cellulose, well, if you look at wood, wood takes forever to break down, and there's not that many things that actually eat wood fibers. That's because those wood fibers are really hard. Those chains of glucose that make up that cellulose fiber are really hard to break down. So decomposers do all the work for us, because what would happen is without them, without breaking all of these things down into smaller molecules that can be used by other things, 
what would happen is you'd just have an accumulation of dead bodies. And we actually had this in the Carboniferous period, um, which was about 300 million years ago. It's in that range. And what happened was we had forests all over the globe, dense bogs of you know, long lines of forests as far as the eye can see. And when these trees would fall over, they would be covered up and nothing would break them down. And it just continued to stack on top and stack on top and stack on top for millions of years. And what this created was all of our current coal deposits. All of the coal that we burn to make electricity comes from the Carboniferous period when all of this dead material was just basically falling on the ground and being preserved in the rock record. It never broke down into constituent parts. It was never reused by the ecosystems. That's why we're able to pull it out of the ground and light it on fire. So decomposers, they're so important because they are taking these big chunky molecules that have been created by animals and plants and they break them up into smaller molecules that can be reused. And without that, without them, we would eventually run out of minerals and other important molecules for life. They would all be locked up in these bodies that couldn't be broken down any further, and basically the whole planet would eventually starve. So your decomposers are just as important as your uh, producers. Why are secondary uh, consumers important? Why are they, why are primary consumers important? They keep populations in check. Primary consumers keep certain plant species from dominating landscapes, and the same thing is true for secondary consumers and top predators. They're keeping the other populations um, lower on the food chain in check. Without having something to go and eat the grasshoppers, grasshoppers could completely wipe out entire plant species. That There's reason why locusts have been considered plagues for thousands of years. So uh, the same thing is true for deer. If there is not something out there that's going to eat the deer and keep their populations in check, they will completely strip a landscape of all of these younger uh, trees and things like that. Ecosystems get out of balance, it can cause collapse in other populations elsewhere. So the entire chain, everybody fits into this whole thing, uh, keeping everybody in check and then making sure we're breaking you back down uh, when you're no longer useful for the ecosystem after you've died. So we're going out this week, we're looking for these things see what's in our ecosystem, and um, yeah, I'm going to do my best to give you some good examples here. Is these boards here have basically been glued together um, by this white fungus. And all through here are all sorts of decomposers. And I am going to move some stuff around here so you can see them. <sighs> Crickets, number one, that guy right there, that, that's a decomposer. They break down dead stuff. That big old house centipede that you see crawling up the wall there, there's been about 20 of those that I've found and uncovered. Um, you can see here's another one right there, taken off. And all of these things are slowly breaking down the cellulose fibers, which is the wood fibers in the wood here. Um, and you can see there's some more uh, of the house centipedes running away. And a few minutes ago, there was about, I don't know, 50 or so roly-polies, which are also, oh, there's a one for you right there, wood louse is what they're also known as. So the tree that this periwinkle vine is growing up is actually already dead. And the reason I know that, number one, is it's missing the other half of its trunk there. But you can see there's some mushrooms growing at the base of the trunk here. Mushrooms are decomposers. Decomposers break down dead material and return it back to the uh, constituent parts that are needed for life so that all that stuff doesn't get locked up and wasted and can be reused. So right now, 
those mushrooms growing on the tree, those big white mushrooms that look like my hat, um, well, they're getting access to the energy they need to survive. They're just doing it off of something that's already dead. can see I believe that is a squash beetle I can't quite tell but it looks like yep two squash beetles here so these guys lay their eggs underneath the leaves of my pumpkin plant and then when they hatch they come out and they eat my leaves and cause my vine to die back so what I'm hoping for and what I'm waiting for are a few of the other creatures to come along and eat them. Uh, luckily you guys can see there's a lot of spiders out here and they tend to help out quite well with the uh, squash beetles. Um, there's also a lot of crickets and crickets aren't really all that harmful, they just break down dead stuff. So when you see crickets in the garden, don't worry, they're mostly just working on the dead leaf material and helping turn that stuff back into soil. Webworms are primary consumers, which basically eat the leaves off of trees and will completely consume all of the leaves off of a branch if given the opportunity. These turn into pretty white little moths. So I'm actually out here at my house today. The time I generally go up to Lions Park, it's been too cold for all of the insect activity and bird activity that we're looking for. Uh, mainly to talk about ecological re roles, ecological interactions. Well, this week it's all about ecological roles. And that's producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, top predators. And this basically describes how energy and matter flow through your ecosystem. It's like a more sophisticated um, food web, so to speak. Anyways, so the reason I'm here at my house, it's a Sunday afternoon, it's about 64 degrees, and I wanted to get out here in the afternoon in, a, in an actual pollen source with all of the different pollinators, primary consumers, um, doing their thing. So flowers are producers, any plant, any photosynthetic um, organism is a producer. It t gets its energy from the sun, it uses sunlight, water, carbon dioxide to make uh, glucose or sugar. And what these particular plants here, these asters, which I've shown you guys before, and, and as I've told you before, this is the last uh, pollen source essentially for your pollinators before the winter comes. Well, what these things do is in order to entice insects to come and get their pollen stuck to the insect, they provide nectar, which is just sugar water. And, you know, the little bees and flies and everything else, they come to drink the sugar water. The pollen gets stuck to them. And they accidentally fertilize the flower, which is what the plant wants. It wants basically the male gamete to cross with the female gamete, the egg cell, and create seeds. That's how they reproduce. So what you see here is a producer producing and a primary consumer in the pollinators because they're taking the sugar from uh, these particular plants. So you right here also have mutualism, which is one of your ecological interactions um, from last week. Again, there's a, a, a plus plus relationship here. The pollinators get a free lunch or not necessarily a free lunch, they get lunch for the work that they do for the plants. So everyone's happy in this particular relationship. So anywho, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna have this video kinda rolling so you can kinda see just how desperately all of the local pollinators are coming to these particular flowers. Um, there's nothing really out there for them to eat right now. So these flowers are absolutely loaded with pollinators, like I said, flies, wasp, bees, uh, butterflies, moths, you name it, they're out here. So, so the plant you have right here, this producer, is a honey vine milkweed plant, and this is generally considered a weed, and it really kind of is. It 
takes over things, weighs them down with these hum humongous uh, seed pods, and, and causes damage to some of your, your shrubs and bushes and things. Um, however, it is a beneficial plant to things like monarch butterflies, which is why I left it here. Now, the bush it's growing on was already on its way out, so I figured, what the heck, I'll go on ahead and let it do its thing and maybe give some monarchs the benefit of having a food source uh, nearby. Now, one of the things I wanted to bring up about this particular producer is it does have a symbiotic relationship with multiple bugs. I mentioned the monarch as one of them. Another bug that this has a uh, symbiotic relationship with is the milkweed beetle. And it's this little orange and black beetle here. Now, remember, symbiotic relationships aren't always good for both involved in the relationship. So in this instance, the milkweed bug um, beetle, is what it is, sucks out the juices and important things inside of the seed pods in other parts of the plants. And that's something that this particular plant doesn't want to happen, obviously, because it wants all those resources to go to the seeds and the proper formation thereof. This is a situation where you have a producer, which would be the honey vine milkweed plant, and then a primary consumer, once again, this milkweed uh, bug or beetle, sitting here and sucking out its juices. So, producer, primary consumer, uh, showing or demonstrating a symbiotic relationship and that of parasitism, because one is benefiting while the other one is not. So, there you go. goose is generally considered a primary consumer. However, in this case, because they do consume insects and uh, some small fish and some crustaceans, we list them as secondary consumers. Most of what they eat, however, is plant material, grasses, sedges, berries, and things like that. The charismatic squirrel is another one of those creatures that you would normally assume is a primary consumer. However, Squirrels, on top of eating things like nuts and berries and whatnot, are actually secondary consumers because they eat insects and bird eggs and other small living things um, that they can get protein and fat from. So, they're secondary consumers. Raccoons are secondary consumers because they pretty much will eat anything they can get their little tiny paws on. They eat plenty of fruits and plant materials, however they also eat insects, rodents, frogs, fish, bird eggs, and basically anything smaller than they are. So, they really are the trash pandas of the United States. The red fox is another secondary consumer which eats just about anything it really can. Its main food sources, however, tend to be rodents, so rabbits and squirrels and rats and field mice are what it mainly consists on from day to day. Hey there, Braves. I hope this video helped you understand what the ecological roles are and what you can expect to find out in your ecosystem. I could have spent hours and hours more adding more and more examples into this video, but I think you have the basic gist of what your decomposers, producers, primary consumers, and secondary consumers are, and how they operate within an ecosystem. I obviously didn't include any top predators in this particular video because, well, being top predators, there's only a few of them out there. So you might expect to find something like a red-tailed hawk or an eagle, or maybe even a coyote if you're lucky, but most likely you won't be able to find those things when you're out doing um, your, your investigation, your field investigation. So, if you don't get one of those, just look something up that's supposedly here in Kansas and add it in. That's it. Mr. Clemens, out. Like, oh my gosh, you guys should totally subscribe to my YouTube channel. For real.